How can we become united as followers of Christ? Find out on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. I'm Dylan Burroughs here with co-host Joseph Kerr, and we are honored to join you today. It's clear from Scripture that God desires unity for His church. Unity is what Jesus prays for, what he commands, and what he says will be the chief argument for unbelieving people coming to know God. But if unity is that important to the heart of God, why isn't it something the church fiercely fights for? In his newest book, Until Unity, Francis Chan calls for believers everywhere to align our hearts with God and his desire to see the church unified. Francis Chan has been a pastor for over 30 years, and he is the New York Times bestselling author of many books, including Crazy Love and Letters to the Church. We're here talking about his new book today, Until Unity, and he comes to us from California. Francis, welcome to A View from the Wall. Hey, thanks. Good to be here. Yes, well, it's great to have you with us. Many people have been influenced by your past books, your conferences, your speaking. You've had quite a ministry over the years. But as you talk in your new book, Unity, you start off by quoting 45 Bible verses on the theme of unity. It's central to what Jesus prayed in John 17, 20 to 23. So as we begin today, walk us through that prayer and what Jesus meant when he prayed for unity among believers. Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to know completely what Jesus meant, but you, you look at those words and they are so strong when he says, I am praying for those who believe in me through the, the word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. There are so many phrases in there where he says he wants everyone who believes in what Jesus did in the cross, who truly trusts in him as Lord and Savior, he wants them all to become one to the extent that the Father and Son are one. And he says he wants that so that the world would believe that Jesus was sent from the Father. And so it, it it appears that he is clearly saying that this unity is possible and that this unity will have a huge impact on the world. And then he goes on and he says, the glory you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. So somehow Jesus has given us, those of us who believe in him, glory. Somehow, the, you know, God's glory dwells in true believers so that we would have the capacity to become one just as the Father and Son are one. And those are just really heavy and amazing words. The capacity for unity is such a powerful concept. Like you said, so many phrases in that. But you say one reason the church does not have unity is a simple but prevalent problem, disobedience. Talk about how unity and disobedience are connected. Yeah, I mean, sin, um, you know, our own pride, our thinking too highly of ourselves and, and our desire to make a name for ourselves, that type of sin keeps us from really believing phrases like, hallowed be thy name. For those of us who are in ministry, we live in a time when we can get caught up in numbers and um, in getting followers and being successful in the world's eyes. And before we know it, suddenly we're caught up in this sin of wanting our names to be known rather than his. And rather than taking a John the Baptist type mindset of he must increase and I must decrease, we start to believe this lie that I must increase so that he can increase. 
And I, I, I got to get my name out there. I have more people know me and like me so that I can impact the world. And, and then pretty soon it just becomes competitive. And, and suddenly people are slamming each other and it's causing a greater division. And, and because of that, we have an unbelieving world looking on going, well, I can't imagine they're right because they mm-hmm. can't even agree with each other. That's well said. You even have celebrity pastors today, and like you say, all of the followers and all of the drama associated with that. And even today, people look at this idea of 40,000 Christian denominations, and some mm-hmm. argue that there's no way to unify these churches and these people without somehow compromising on Christian essential doctrines. Is unity even possible for the church today? Tell us a little bit about that in a couple of minutes before our break. Yeah, I mean, I... <laughs> For a long time, I haven't even broached this because it just, it felt impossible. But, you know, I remember one thing I learned uh, in college, one of my professors was talking about how God often would set the stage for his own heroics. He would put people in an impossible situation. He'd get them to the edge of the Red Sea, and then he would do this crazy miracle. He'd have you know, Lazarus in the tomb, we'd have Christ in the tomb, and it just seems impossible. And so it it has to be possible. And that's, that's what our God does. And maybe it's so bad with 40,000 denominations, and even more individuals every day starting their own groups, um, and believing that the only ones that have it right. But it's, it's, it's a perfect setup for our God who wants this and desires it, not at the expense of truth, not at the expense of holiness, but somehow, God, you can, I believe, I know God can cause us to pursue truth passionately, pursue holiness fervently, and maintain eagerly the unity of the Spirit. Well, that's such a great perspective, and we're going to take a quick break and continue this fascinating discussion with Francis Chan about his new book, Until Unity. Stick with us here on A View from the Wall. From I Am a Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am a Watchman Minute. In 1 Chronicles 13.32, we read, The sons of Issachar were wise, for they understood the times and they knew what to do. Watchmen ask God to help them understand the times, to help them see what should be seen and know how to say what should be said. Watchmen study the Word, watch the news, and look to see what is happening in the world and how that ties into Bible prophecy. Watchmen see that multiple signs indicate the return of the Lord is near. Are you ready for the rapture? Are your friends and family members? Visit IamAWatchman.com for information designed to help individuals, just as the Bible says, understand the times and know what to do. That's IamAWatchman.com. Be bold. Be faithful. Be a watchman. IamAWatchman.com. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. As Joe and I continue our conversation today with Francis Chan and his new book, Until Unity, we want to talk a little bit about some of the historical examples and a path that we can follow today to be united as followers of Christ. And we'll talk first about why unity is important uh, from the perspective of difficulty. And we'll put it this way. Why is unity so difficult for believers? Francis, give us your take. (laughs) Well, because... uh... Well, because I'm a jerk. (laughs) There's sin in my life. And if you get close enough to me, I will hurt you somehow. Um, Not intentionally. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, if, if, if I am not close to the Lord, pride will come out of my mouth. Uh, Defensiveness, um, self-centeredness. And, uh, and I, I hate that about me. I can't wait till it's all gone. Um, but we we do things and we say things as sinners. And not only that, but we all have holes in our theology. And we we don't have, no one, we, you know, we don't have, we're, we're going to see like in a mirror dimly right now. 
And so that's the best we can do until we see him face to face. And so while we fight for truth, um, we're going to be off. And maybe sometimes we will uh, think something is uh, primary when it's really a secondary issue. And we'll divide over people out of a, a desire to fight for truth. When in reality, we're actually hurting the church. And other times, we'll, you know, no one has that perfect answer of once they cross this line and only this line. Um, and we've been trying to figure out that doctrinal statement and everything else for, for centuries. And uh, the church just keeps getting more divided the more we talk. You give some great examples of that in the book, Paul's letter to the early Galatian church, Martin Luther's mm -hmm. Reformation, 16th century Protestant churches, and of course, in modern evangelical churches, the division and the disunity has been the problem all along. Why does this keep happening? Yeah, I think, you know, I know for me anyways, I know that the more I studied, um, the more knowledge I thought I knew the less loving I was towards people. You know, like in Ephesians 4, it talks about uh, this unity, but he, he says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So there's something about this. He says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, you know, when you jump into academia, you're so focused on debating and what's right and, you know, who's right, who's wrong. And it's very hard to survive in that world with all humility and gentleness. And we're living in a time when if you speak with gentleness, you won't get as many views. You know, if you, you try to post something online and it's gentle and humble, there it's just not going to get as many clicks as if you're uh, uh, abrasive um, and biting. And we, 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 we tend to click on the negative stuff, on the abrasive things, and yet Scripture is telling us to be eager to maintain the unity of spirit. And that happens when it's all humility and gentleness. Oh, that's so well said. There's this tension, I would say, between the times when we need to, you know, put forth unity to forgive and then times where we need to take a stand and fight. And I enjoy in chapter seven of your book, it says it requires a fight. And you quote Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Tell us a little bit about this tension between being unified and giving others preference at times and this time when you need to stand firm and fight in the faith. Yeah, I mean, we have examples all throughout Scripture of times when people have had to stand alone and fight against sin. Um, you think about even the, the Levites and, you know, and how God was so blessed when um, was it, was it Phineas who, you know, drove the spear through those feet. I mean, they're, they're just very strong fighting, like, whoa, intense moments of Scripture and so we are people who have to stand for truth, and yet we have to be so incredibly careful that we're not attacking the very body of Christ. You, you know, so, so you have uh, verses like uh, in Titus, when he calls us to fight, in, in verse 10, he goes, As for the person who stirs up division after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he's self-condemned. As a part of the fight is, gosh, this person keeps stirring up division. I've warned them, and the Bible says have nothing to do with them. That's a warped person, sinful, self-condemned. There's a time when we need to walk away from certain people, um, but we need to be careful and make sure we have biblical reason to do so. And so much of it is their sin. It's the sin of divisiveness. Now, when it comes to theological accuracy, I think that's where people are quick to jump and say, oh, well, this guy believes this now. And, and you have to go, well, are you sure 
that's something that's supposed to divide the body of Christ at that particular issue. First of all, are you sure he actually believed that, or did you just hear that from someone? Or could he have possibly slipped in one of his three million statements that he made, you know? Um, and, and there's just too much of this, you know, everyone say, oh, well, Second John to stay away from them. And it's like, well, Second John was dealing with a very specific issue that I don't think this person disagrees with. And I think we just kind of, I don't know, we're, we're just too quick to separate from people when the scriptures aren't clear enough about that is a dividing issue. Right. You even see this guilt by association that if you speak at the same conference as somebody else that the other person doesn't like, then suddenly you're a bad guy too. And so there's this chain of events that unfolds where the relationships are connected, but you don't necessarily hold to the same convictions or belief as the other person. Exactly. I mean, for me personally, I like speaking at places where I don't agree with everyone, you know, hopefully to bring light rather than just going to where I agree with them all. And I understand there's a danger in that, but I also understand that there's a danger from not infiltrating different circles and just letting those people, you know, be in their own world. But we have to go and be light in some of those places. And and yet at the same time, we need to have conversations. And I've seen many helpful conversations and people have corrected me on things where I thought, oh, I thought you believed this. You're like, no, not at all. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I judged you. You know, I, I've spoken badly about you. And I really feel bad about that because that's a part of the body of Christ. But, uh, yeah, I think we have, we have too many people who are quick to divide. And if there's any group we need to divide from, it would be them. Yes, well, it's certainly a matter of importance to focus on essential doctrine, but we also have to remember we are family, and we'll talk about this more when we come back in just a moment. So stick with us here for more on A View from the Wall. The Bible predicts the rapture of the church is coming. Are you ready? Soon many will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Only they will escape the dark days that are coming a time of tribulation that will usher in the Antichrist and great destruction upon the entire earth. There's only one escape, one way, one light, one truth. His name is Jesus. He came and died so that we may live forever with Him. But to receive this new life, there are three things we must do. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. Ask for forgiveness and receive His grace. B. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He came, lived, died, rose again, and will come again. Believe that He is Lord and God. C. Commit to walk His path, the path He wants you to walk, and walk it out by faith. Then you'll be ready for the return of the Lord. To learn more about the rapture and how to know for sure, visit amirapture-ready.org. Welcome back to A View from the Wall. As Joe and I talk with Francis Chan, author of the new book, Until Unity, we want to challenge and encourage you in your personal walk with God today. And Francis, you quote Dietrich Bonhoeffer in your book, noting that talking about unity is easy, but doing unity is difficult. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, obviously we we shared about how, you know, the sin in our own lives um, affects uh, the unity of the church, obviously. But there's also something else that, that, that Bonhoeffer mentions in Life Together, and I'm not going to quote him perfectly, but he explains how if you are not close to God and if you have not spent time in his presence, like deeply in his presence, and if you have not spent time out in the world with unbelievers, he says, then when you come together to fellowship, you'll actually do harm to the fellowship. And, and I, I thought, wow, we don't. We don't talk about this. We just think anyone that opens their mouth and says something that sounds Christian, that's a, that's a good thing for the body. Um, but, you know, if we are not close to God, if we have not truly 
been in worship of him, adoring him. And if we're not truly close to those who are in the world and understanding the state of the world, then when we come together, we're just going to speak nonsense to one another and, uh, and, and actually hurt the church. And so a lot of our disunity comes from, I believe, too many words spoken in ignorance. At least that's, that's how I've added to the problem. Francis, in 2020, the church was forced into lockdown, and many became only online meetings. How has that affected the church in this area of unity? Well, honestly, um, I, I, there's been some good things and there's been some bad things. I mean, the bad thing is that, uh, you know, people are creating their own gatherings online and, and further separating themselves from others. You know, the other bad things are people are leaving their communities because now they can watch a more exciting uh, service from a, another place. And so, you know, relationships are getting weaker. But the good thing is that this this whole pandemic is has caused us to go through something together. And it made us realize that, hey, things probably will never be the same again. And so we're moving towards something. I think there are a lot of people that, that, that are going, this doesn't make sense. Why do we keep splitting more and more and more and more? And now with this pandemic, and it probably won't be the last, it won't be the last, it, things can get more severe and it's caused us to think, okay, what really matters and how should the church look when this is all said and done? And I do believe the Spirit has been stirring people during this time to a greater desire for oneness in the body of Christ. Well, that's so well said. And in many ways, people see this as a foreshadowing of times in the future where there will be difficult times in the last days. So as you look at what's happening in our world today, it's an encouragement not to give up meeting together, but to do so all the more, as Hebrews 10, 25 tells us, as we look forward to the day of the Lord's return. Francis, we like to include in every program a word of challenge and encouragement to those who are actively watching, warning, witnessing, and seeking to finish well in these difficult last days. Talk to our watchmen and women for a few minutes about their role spreading this message of unity. Hmm. Guard your own heart. Make sure in this world where you are hearing so many messages and you have such a desire to spread the good news as you see it, make sure you spend time in his presence. Like, you know, like the psalm says in Psalm 27, where you're just gazing at his beauty. Not even just saying a lot, but just understanding who he is on the throne and understanding the gap between this being who's allowing you to breathe right now and hear my voice. Like he's in control of all of this, sitting on his throne in, in unapproachable light to just sit there and imagine heaven in silence, just, just to clear your mind and worship him. Like really, are you seeking him and, and praying, hallowed be your name. I live just hallowed be your name. That's all I care. I don't care what anyone thinks of me. I just want your name lifted up. And the more time you spend alone in silence, just adoring him, staring at him, gazing at his beauty and all that he's done, the more effective and more powerful and more godly the words that do come out of your mouth will be. And so I would just encourage you Make time for this. Turn off the electronic. Clear your mind so that you can mean the words that you pray to him. We've been enjoying this fascinating conversation with Francis Chan and his new book, Until Unity. As you listen today, you may want to get more information about the book. We want to encourage you to go to UntilUnityBook.com. That's UntilUnityBook.com. We have about three minutes left in our time together today, Francis, and I want you to take that time to share a prayer with those who are listening today, uh, seeking purity, seeking unity, and seeking unity also in their relationships with other followers of Christ, if you would. Oh, Father, 
our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, Francis, we appreciate you being with us. No, thanks for having me. And let us say we appreciate you for joining us for today's program. We want to encourage you and serve you in any way we can. Take a moment today to go to IamAWatchman.com and check out our resources and join us next time here on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the donate button. Thanks for listening and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.